Good evening. This talk is entitled Ideas America Rising, A Call for a New Great Awakening. And this talk is dedicated to my daughter Maeve and grandson Gideon, who drowned tragically in the Chesapeake Bay on April the 2nd. I want to thank all of you who have consoled me and comforted me, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to speak to each of you. This is my first public event as I crawl out of an abyss of grief and sorrow. Forgive me if my focus wavers or I invoke mystical numbers. Prayer, poetry, philosophy, and the language of the human heart has its numbers and rhythms. I have been reading Whitman's elegy on another tragic April death, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, with its trinity of great star, lilac, and thrush. I too see a trinity as I contemplate death and rising, a trinity of the individual American, the one community of America, and the American spirit. This trinity tracks the three basic philosophical perspectives of self-consciousness, consciousness, and transcendental consciousness. Walt Whitman's poem addresses the despair following the assass assassination of President Abraham Lincoln and the sacrifice of 800,000 dead Americans in the Civil War. You may feel despair in the land now. What you do with this feeling is your choice. I recommend that you choose to be Americans, arise as one people, and assert the American spirit by a dialectic practice and a new great awakening of virtues and values aiming at a more perfect union. A new great awakening can transform our spirits and enable us anew to keep our eyes on the prize. Dialectic questioning is the dialogue of democracy. It is by the virtue of civil dialectic discussion that we shall overcome. We shall overcome the tyranny over the minds, hearts, and bodies of individuals, communities, and the whole world. Dialectic respectfully evaluates all points of view, resurrects moribund public discourse, and lifts our aims toward virtuous purposes. America's motto, a pluribus unum, one out of many, is a good description of dialectic activity. We practice dialectic by evaluating all perspectives in relationship to our common purpose. Public discourse is in peril when marketing slogans replace dialectic. The revolutionary technology of tweets, TikToks, social media, memes and quips can bind us in chains. We can enslave ourselves. We can surrender our philosophic quest for the good the true, and the beautiful, to the methods and goals of mere marketing. A pluribus unum, one arising from many, aims at unity, but marketing succeeds by creating anxiety and fear, dividing us into targeted consumer groups. Marketing cuts life into segments, making us feel broken, unless we purchase the latest must-have product Fail to brand yourself, and you lose not only your glamour, but your soul. Cultivating fear and anxiety works whether you seek to saturate market share with cosmetics, the latest electronic device, infomercials, political advertising, or tweets. Don't get me wrong, I am no Luddite. I celebrate our revolution in technology in instantaneous global communications, global supply chain, and universal capital. Yet I also recognize that this unprecedented revol revolution risked unimagined alienation and despair. Let's celebrate the virtue of prosperity, but recognize the unprecedented threat to individuals, communities, and our planet. Feeling left behind? Relief is just a purchase, a meme, or a swallow away, right? No, it isn't. A great awakening of thinking and acting dialectically 
is the only American way out. This talk, Ideas America Rising, has three parts. I ask you to consider three questions. Part one, what is America and what is an American? Part two, what are some ideal types of Americans and American texts that shape our understanding of the ideas of America and American? Part three, how might the Trinity, America, Americans, and the American spirit utterly transform education and enable freedom through the liberal arts in new ways never before possible? I hope the ideas in this 40-minute talk deepen your relationship with St. John's College. A Great Awakening is a radical proposal, radical both in being new and in being old and original down to the very roots. A Great Awakening has happened before and it can happen again. Part one, what is America and what is an American? What do these new world words mean? The American, America, and the American spirit. Three different words designating three different ideas or three aspects of one idea America. Out of this trinity of one citizen, one people, and one spirit, can a true, good, and beautiful new way arise, a way to restore the health of the world's people, body and soul. I think that we can arise through this trinity expressed in our motto, one arising from many. Arising thus, the great human heart, the world's heart, and the heart of each person can be reborn, resurrected, and saved. What are the truths a true American holds? What is the ideal type we call a good American? What resurrects the word America from dead letter to beautiful living idea? What enables one people to flourish anew? Our foundational truth is that all of us are created equal and endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these rights are life, liberty, equality, and the pursuit of happiness. These are explicit goals in the Declaration of Independence, for which America strives. In addition to these four, we have other implicit virtues, and these include the four basic classical virtues of courage, Andrea, justice, Dikaisune, Temperance, Sophrosune, and Wisdom, Sophia or Phronesis, as some classical philosophers prefer. And three classic spiritual virtues, Faith, Fides, Hope, Space, and Caritas, Love. These seven basic virtues and three American rights of life, liberty, and equality are hallmarks of people of spirit, well-equipped to pursue true happiness as individuals, and as a community. This list is not exhaustive, nor without contradiction and conflict. Nevertheless, these virtues, among others, are true, true goals. Virtues are the foundation of human endeavor. Virtues are purposes for the sake of which we live. And virtues distinguish vitality from morbidity in the trinity of self, community, and soul in the trinity of self-consciousness, consciousness, and God-consciousness. If virtue disappears from our common language, if we are afraid and ashamed to speak, act, and lead with virtue, tyranny will triumph. Awakening a new appreciation of virtue is crucial at this time. A dialectic pursuit of virtue is the prescription to renew our health, the health of America, of Americans and the American spirit. In the preamble to the Constitution of the United States of America, Americans pledge to form a more perfect union. This is not primarily a rational goal. If already truly one, can one become more one? This is absurd, illogical nonsense. But it is beautiful. 
We may know what this illogical nonsense means in our heart. We may feel it. The goal more perfect union gives us purpose. This idea symbolizes the heartfelt endeavor we seek and the practice of not merely living, but living well, like a true American. The one is not logically the many, but individual Americans one by one working to make American truths live, make us all arise and flourish together. Philosophers, those who want to live well and not just to live, are called to act as Socrates was called by his city and also by his inner voice or daimon. Leading with virtue can be difficult. Faith, hope, and love can divide and unite, bring sorrow and joy, cause peace and suffering. The same words may affirm or break our relationships, but a relationship, like a living language, changes and grows. A good relationship deepens, matures, becomes more attentive, kinder, and more aware of the truth, the laws of nature, and nature's God, absent which nothing lives at all. Aiming at virtue will cause leadership, service, thinking, dialectic, and the love of wisdom to thrive. The preamble of the Constitution states several ways to form a more perfect union. We do so by establishing justice, ensuring peace, and defending ourselves against our three ancient enemies, famine, disease, and war. We also make a more perfect union by promoting the general welfare and ensuring the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to all the generations to come. Our mission emerges dynamically as the new words America and American symbolize a new world of possibilities. American language common among us reminds us that it is not too late to seek a newer world. It is not too late to have a new birth of freedom, however dark things look and however many corpses litter the ground. It is not too late to ensure that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. It is not too late to ensure that our planet shall not perish. Active, incarnate, pragmatic, purposeful living is truly the essence of what it is to be an American. Walt Whitman called himself, quote, one of the roughs, a designation I happily apply to myself too. He radically claimed that, quote, Americans may well be the most philosophical people ever. And he wrote that, quote, Americans of all nations at any time upon earth have probably the fullest poetical nature. The United States themselves are essentially the greatest poem. Whitman called himself one of the roughs because he was rough hewn, a work in progress, a plank, a draft, an American, an emerging man. For Whitman, the word American describes a flourishing human being. Our pragmatism brings virtue to life. In America, the practice of philosophy we practice it and think and act anew. We do not just think, we marry thought with action. America instantiates virtues in the pragmatism of the possible and are bold, resourceful, courageous, imaginative, and entrepreneurial adventure. We build the earth. We aim at the true, the good, and the beautiful. It is characteristic of an American to believe that these forms can live in the world and not just in the mind. A true American practices civic virtue, civility, and philosophy with everyone they encounter. Of course, we often fail to act. We fail to achieve our goals. Of course, we are hypocritical, weak, base, cruel, and fearful at times. And yet even at our worst, our dialogue of democracy is at work. America is grounded on ideas, 
not on the shibboleths of history, tribalism, religion, birth, or pedigrees of race and language that ground ordinary nationalism. Americans transcend the idea of nationalism meta-nationally. We speak the common language of the roughs, as Whitman noted. We go to ground. American roughs roll up their sleeves and get to work. Like Socrates, we recognize the strength of dialectic, the living power of virtues, the transformations wrought by true words, and the risk that our mission and idea can be betrayed by slogans fit for commercial marketing. In America, ideas have deeper consequences. Ideas put to work enable and endow us to form a more perfect union for ourselves and for posterity. Tyranny dies insofar as dialectic lives. Tyrants fear virtuous citizens. The dialogue of democracy aimed at true virtue breaks chains and tears down all the walls of oppression and slavery. Dialectic overcomes tyranny and establishes faith in freedom, in individuals, and in the political order. Practice dialectic and you enable the true purpose of government to establish the conditions that enable the citizens to be virtuous. To establish the conditions that enable the citizens to be virtuous. As Burke said, what is liberty without wisdom and without virtue? It is the greatest of all possible evils, for it is folly, vice, and madness without tuition and restraint. Now let me wrangle these thoughts to the ground in the second of three parts of this talk. Let's look at some ideal types of Americans and their writings, touchstones by which we might test the gold of our own character and imitate their thought. And then in the final, third, briefest part of my talk, I will ask us to think about how a new great awakening might arise. Part two, some ideal types of Americans and foundational American texts. I am going to cite texts because reading what others have thought and said is a great source of dialectic and virtue. We can have a great conversation with the dead as well as with our contemporaries. In the words of James Baldwin, quote, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive, who had ever been alive. It is a common American claim from John Winthrop, Jefferson, Lincoln, Emerson, Thoreau, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Frederick Douglass, and all those irrepressible organizers of the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention that America is something new under the sun. Newness means fresh thinking, innovation, and it tasks the soul to marshal our greatest truths. America being new makes the classical quest for true virtue possible. America has been from the beginning a beacon to all those around the world who yearn to be free. America comes to represent the new when aboard the ship Arabella, John Winthrop asks his newly arrived survivors of the Atlantic crossing to quote, be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. For Winthrop in 1630, the word we signifies a new world and all people realize it. In the America to come, we shall practice justice, fairness, liberty, equality, community, and prosperity. We will ensure the blessings to those present, to our children, and to our children's children. Here are Winthrop's inspiring words. Quote, We ought to count ourselves knit together by this bond of love and live in the exercise of it. To provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. 
For this end we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work, our community as members of the same body. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Is it a good thing to think that the eyes of all people are upon us when we behave well and when we behave poorly? That a community of people the size of St. John's College could think this way in 1630, after a deadly Atlantic crossing, can give us courage, vis vision, and hope. Humble and heroic, Winthrop sees us as a new Jerusalem, built in our green and pleasant land, a dawn breaking, a city on a hill, an ideal type for the hopes of all the world's people. A century later, Winthrop's vision recurs in the first American Great Awakening led by Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, an awakening that led to the American Revolution, a story well worth telling in detail another time. Fifty years later, we awakened again in 1776, when Thomas Jefferson described a new order under the sun an incarnation in one people of the virtues of liberty, quality, justice, and hope. The idea of America is born again in the living virtues and values stated in the transcendent words of the Declaration of Independence. Quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter and abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles. Those who wrote and enacted the Declaration understood that they were flawed human beings, American roughs, not angels, Although subject to the failings and hypocrisy of human nature, they diligently and courageously applied ideas and virtues, creating a national government under law within a decade. Criticize their failings if you must, but beware polished tyrants who can look into others' souls. Virtues cannot be unerringly and consistently followed. The founders knew we needed to improve ourselves, and America informs, practice, laws, and institutions. They foresaw we may need further great awakenings of vision and renewal, arising from the ground of our foundational goals, principles, and virtues. Virtue is a practice, not a possession, forever and inevitably practiced well and ill at once. Rough-hewn though we are, we try and try as we intertwine liberty, life, and happiness. More perfect is two steps forward, one step back. The truth is, virtues conflict. Recognizing this, at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, 100 signers of a new declaration, sentiments, addressed shortcomings in the Declaration and Constitution. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Amelia Bloomer, and Frederick Douglass were among the organizers seeking a new awakening. The Seneca Falls Declaration changed the life of a young school teacher, Susan B. Anthony, and further galvanized the untiring anti-slavery Methodists and Quakers to unmask every tyrannical compromise of the virtue of liberty for all. 
Frederick Douglass, a hero for sure, having recently escaped slavery in Maryland and written a classic autobiography, which should be included in every canon, made an impassioned speech to persuade the women led by Stanton to demand voting rights. They were not going to do so, thinking voting rights an impractical goal, a bridge too far. But Douglas understood the virtue of liberty in his gut. Liberty, in his prophetic words, comes out of three boxes, quote, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. The principles of the Declaration of Sentiments that the Convention passed include these, quote, women under this government are entitled to exercise her inalienable right to elective franchise, the first right of every citizen. And the Seneca Falls Declaration specifically objects to, quote, her exclusion from the ministry and to a different code of morals for men and women. Tyrants, personal, political, and spiritual are accused. Quote, he has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. The declaration continues, quote, fraudulently interpreted scriptural authority is hollow. Note well that the ideal types I've cited, Winthrop, the Declaration, the Preamble, and the Seneca Falls Convention, arose from small groups of people. Perhaps 100 survivors aboard the ship Arabella, 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 41 at the Constitutional Convention, and 100 signed the Seneca Falls Declaration. Great awakenings begin with the work of a few dedicated people. If you take no other truth away from this talk tonight, remember never to underestimate what a small group of dedicated Americans can do. The ideas of a few ardent philosophers can change everything. Just a couple more examples crucial to our story, and I will conclude this section on foundational American texts. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln awakens America again with a succinct, identifying idea, government of the people, by the people, for the people. He is dedicating a veterans cemetery at Gettysburg as if leading, quote, the chorus of the Union in mystic chords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land. In the bloody battle of Gettysburg, my great-great-grandfather, Private James Townsend, was shot in the chin, bearing this opened wound for the rest of his life. He lived disabled, but 800,000 Americans died in a war that ended slavery. More Americans died freeing slaves than our total deaths in all the subsequent wars. Americans understand that for virtues, it is worth risking your life. At the urging of Frederick Douglass, Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation on New Year's Day, and American freedom woke anew, sustained by the cartridge boxes of 200,000 newly recruited African-American troops who made the end of slavery certain. Lincoln put it succinctly, quote, we hear highly resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. A century later, we awakened again when Martin Luther King's sermons, letters, and organized mass civil, civil disobedience kept our eyes on the prize and awakened us anew. King said, quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We aim to be free at last. King's words and deeds renewed the virtue of freedom and made our union more perfect than ever before. These texts and ideal types show how we resuscitate the virtues of Athens, Jerusalem, and Rome that may have died without America. 
moribund ideas become active and vital as America resurrects some classical virtues and ideas and philosophies and makes other classical virtues anew. America actively resurrects the dead virtues of the old world in the life of the new. Most especially, America makes freedom new. Freedom in America goes beyond breaking the chains of class and caste as it was in the old world. Our history exercises freedom anew in that America refuses. America is a story of refusing. Refusing to settle for things as they always were. Instead, we look at things as they are, while we imagine things that could be. We are determined to break all chains that manacle minds and hearts and to cross all frontiers to make true virtues live anew. To be sure, there were ideas of freedom in the past. In the Chinese Empire, one man might be free. In Athens, 5,000 men. In Rome, many more citizens. But in America, we are all free. Our freedom is inalienable. A new great awakening is possible on this ground. Now part three, the final and briefest part of my talk. Let's think together how a new great awakening can begin. We are members of the St. John's community and pledge to practice, teach, and live the liberal arts. What does our mission of freeing minds require of us? In 1937, we chose to become a radical American liberal arts college. By doing so, we freed the liberal arts from the oligarchy of the few. We unscrewed the locks from the doors that hid the old world's learning, aired out the classroom, freed wisdom from layers of dust and decay, and freed learning from the inherited wealth of the privileged. St. John's awakened liberal arts in America for the American roughs. Here are the words of St. John's president, Stringfellow Barr, arising in the despair of economic depression, racism, and violence in 1938, arguing for a great awakening of liberal education. Quote, We have asked for what animals and small children want, but not what free men and women require. We've shouted hysterically for freedom of speech, a free press, and free assembly, while one by one these freedoms have disappeared in one modern state after another. But we have not demanded, as our ancestors did, both for themselves and for their children, a mind free from ignorance, an awakened imagination, and a disciplined reason without which we cannot effectually use our other freedoms, or even preserve them. The present time is not comparable to 1938, and yet now we have a new mission, a new errand into the wilderness to raise America up from anxiety, fear, and despair. In the tradition of the American transcendentalist, from Emerson to ourselves, we understand that the world was given to all of us in common. We are entitled to live transcendentally in this wilderness by nature and nature's God. If we are failing to do so, we can awaken. We can turn around, just as the prisoners in Plato's famous cave allegory turn around toward the light. And we can also turn institutions around by recollecting our foundational goals and virtues. Absent virtue institutions ossify we begin to work for them instead of making institutions work for us. With virtue as our aim, they and we can flourish. The torches of goddesses Gaia, Earth, and Liberty cast enough light in the cave to enable us to see our way out. Manacles of tyranny, fear, and anxiety keep our fellow prisoners and us in the shadows of the cave. Be not content with shadows. Turn toward the light of truth. As Plato's prisoners, we can crawl our way up to the light and liberate ourselves and others from shadows by diligently practicing dialectic.
and in doing so, we can keep our eyes on the prize. Plato calls this prize, quote, the idea of the good, the universal author of all things beautiful and right, parent of light, of the Lord of light in this, in this visible world, and the immediate source of reason and truth in the intellectual. This vision of the good, which the practice of virtue and dialectic makes possible, enables America to build a world more equal, more free, and more flourishing with happiness and life. Socrates calls this vision, quote, the power upon which he who would act with reason, either in public or private life, must have his eye fixed. Absent this light, there is no beginning and no truly beautiful wholeness. Both Plato and the author of Genesis begin with light, so let it be so. When we study the Republic at St. John's College, we do not study disembodied forms. We incarnate forms. We inhabit them. The purpose of philosophy is not mental. Wisdom is a practice. We study the good not only to talk about it, but to be good. Virtue guides us, active, incarnate, embodied in self, community, and the soul. By aiming at virtue, we can awaken language from the limits and bondage of marketing to live dialectically in our hearts and guts. America's prescriptive values and rights require each of us to have the courage of one of the roughs. Now, since I'm speaking tonight at St. John's College, some say I have a responsibility to speak not as an American rough, but as a professional academic. I should situate myself in the academic tradition, duly cite sources, investigate current academic literature, and group myself among the segregated disciplines of ethics, politics, philosophy, political science, social relations, history of ideas, economics, statistics, and theology. But tonight this rough refuses. It would be faithless of me to abandon the dialectic pursuit for academic demands that we must be limited to the kind of descriptive, operational, technical, and value-free objectivity that marginalizes the liberal arts, the practice of dialectic, and the American experience. Value-free academic and social methods that disregard virtue are not wise and will not free minds. Better to have the kinds of conversations we have at St. John's to confront difficult questions at their roots, examine assumptions radically, do the dialectic work of thinking actively in light of unifying purposes and goals, and work to make one out of many. The dialectic practiced in the St. John's classroom cares for and respects all perspectives voiced at the human table in pursuit of a more perfect union. The conventional, much favored demand for a value-free permanent solution to human problems displays an arrogance that masks anxiety and fear of being wrongly grouped or poorly branded. The liberal arts do not make rough works in progress such as we are, polished and correctly branded. Do not surrender America to the marketeers who do not have your interests at heart. Marketing slogans like brands seduce you to spend life you do not have for purchases you don't need. You do not always get what you pay for. If marketing determines the structure and content of education, no minds will be free. For marketeers treat us as creatures desiring nothing other than to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. They can't imagine that it might be good for us to suffer. Suffering can be a great teacher. Marketeers want your goal to be to live as long as possible rather than to risk living well. You are a more efficient consumer if you live the greatest number of days, regardless of tyranny and abject conditions, as long as you are well-branded. Marketeers must undervalue the practice of dialectic for dialectic diminishes the fear, anxiety, and group think that profits marketeering. Marketers don't want you to have the courage of virtue. They don't want you to refuse. 
Marketing reduces you to consumers, diminishes your humanity to a commodity. You must package your product well, especially if that product is yourself. Marketing ever stimulates your desire for money, tyrannizes you to live in anxiety and fear, and divides one people into many targeted groups. Power is claimed to be real, not truth. Such thinking is old, cynical, and worthy of Polemarchus, not Socrates or other proto-Americans. It has become clear, I hope, that America is a word and idea which develops as we speak, write, think, and act anew. America is a movement, philosophy's most significant movement, form, and ideal type. A true American is a philosopher of virtue, strong in character, friendship and citizenship, rugged in faith. Purpose-driven institutions, such as the United States of America and St. John's College, live by aiming at virtue and fail when they forget to. Dialectic conversation is engaged and caring. America is the idea that best symbolizes the flourishing relationship between the self and the whole community, household, and planet. The best instantiation of community is in the humble citizen willing to serve the common good and not just selfish interests. Out of this many, one is possible. In the self, in the personal experience of nature, God, community, friendship, love, procreative urge, and citizenship, humans will flourish. To be an American is to be a citizen of the world, to be at home in household earth, to recognize the global nature of our goals, our economy, our technology, our ideas, and our responsibility to serve others and our blue planet. America is actually a meta-nation. We can lead the way out of a 500-year historical digression, a time of virtue subordinated to the limitations of nationalism and its darker attributes of racism, violence, conformity, faithlessness, money-grubbing, and idolatry. Nations make bad gods. Gaia, our Earth, is a true goddess, better than nationalism, incomparable to any national idol. America understands this common errand into the wilderness. American virtues, ideas, and the liberal arts will save the planet. America gave the world the picture of the blue earth as seen whole, beautiful, and living from space. This vision utterly changes how we see ourselves. We dare to look boldly into the heavens, to learn and to see. We dare to lift up our eyes into the hills and say, why not a new city? Why not make the world new? Let's have a great awakening that renews the virtue of America. It could begin here and now at St. John's College. Why not?